The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and in this episode, we're going back just about 19 years to look at a few old music players. So when I say a couple of music players, of course, we're talking reasonably before MP3. Uh, and I've got a couple of examples of tape uh, cassette players, or mini cassette, I think is the proper title. Uh, and I've got a couple of mini disc players. Now, two of these are just kind of for show because one of the weird quirks of purchasing things like this on eBay means you end up in a bulk buy. Now, I did want to quickly show this one. This this Walkman comes from somewhere in the early 90s and I had one almost exactly like this when I was younger. Uh, just to prove it, here's a photo. Now I don't want to say that my parents bought this for me and my sister because they were fed up of listening to our tapes in the car, but I'm pretty sure my parents bought us these so they didn't have to listen to our tapes in the car. And who can blame them? The uh, Ring Raiders How It All Began episode on loop can only be played so many times to an adult. But really simple controls, physical, mechanical buttons. The other example I've got here is a, a mini disc player, but it is very, very much worse for wear. Um, to say that the battery has leaked in here would be a gross understatement. And it's so bad that the USB port, which was a really cool feature, which very few mini discs had, also full of corrosion. So goodness only knows what that one looks like inside, but that's not the point. The two that I really wanted to focus on are these. Now this is the Sony Walkman WM-EX631 and this is from 2002 and this is the Sony Minidisc MZ-R410 which came from January 2003. So these were only released a year apart at the absolute most. So it absolutely blows my mind that these two were ever on the market at basically the same time. The Philips cassette comes from 1969, whereas the mini disc was released in 1992. Crazy. So let's start with a cassette tape. Now I wanted to try and find one like this, one of the later examples, um, because they are amazing. And I remember a friend having one at the time and just being stunned because this was the sort of thing I was used to. Look at the difference there. Looks like you could almost put that one in there. To the extent that this one is so small, the front cover is very thin aluminium. I've actually brought my calipers out just so I could find out how thick that is. So the aluminium sheet on the front here is essentially 0.4 millimeters. That's so small. And the quality of these Sony cassette players, even the late ones, just fantastic. These sound, if you recorded these on a good medium onto a high quality tape, these sounded almost as good as anything else out there. Certainly when you're on the run using headphones and earbuds or whatever else came with them. This Walkman um, has what is often described as a gunstick battery in this slot, but that is for whatever reason really stuck closed and I can't get it off. And I don't know if that's because it's in there and it's expanded or it's corroded, but I don't want to force it. Uh, hoping that if we can come at this from another way, we'll just sort of reveal it. And it may not even be in there. Uh, okay, there you go. There's the very small weight of the outside cover of the tape drawer. And that instantly reveals all the tape transport mechanisms. So you've got, I think that would technically be the capstan. And those would be the pinch rollers. You can see they're spring loaded and they just press the cassette onto those rollers when it's playing. And that provides the transport at the fixed speed that you need for tape playback. Because bear in mind the spools around these will change size depending on where on the tape it is. So you don't use these for transport, you're just using those for spool and uh, release. And you can see on the read write, oh, well no it's not a read write head, it's only a read head. Actually there are four tracks in here. And the reason for that, you can see on here it says auto reverse. So this doesn't need you to take the tape out, flip it over. So this actually has to be able to read the left and right channel for both sides of the tapes uh, in one physical position. So that's a four read head. 
Oh dear. Yeah, it definitely looks like a battery was left in here. Oh yeah. Look at that blue colour in there. That is uh, copper sulfate? Uh, maybe. I'm not that much of a chemist, but yeah, you could definitely get blue copper compounds, so that corrosion has done nasty things. Okay, nickel metal hydride battery. I'm going to suggest that's not very healthy. Certainly the contacts on here aren't. There we go. Wow. Belt drives. Single motor, which presumably is multi-directional. And actually that still moves wonderfully. For belts that are getting over 20 years old, that has got a fantastic feel to it. Oh look, so up here, you've got a couple of tiny little switches. Those interface with the bottom of the tape, telling it what kind of tape there is in there. Now that is the direct replacement for the buttons which told you normal or metal or chromium. Now I can't remember, I'm not a tape aficionado, but I seem to remember that those two notches could mean either chrome, metal oxide or ferrite, which were the three options essentially the normal on the, uh, the old tape player. And so this would know automatically which kind of tape you had in there. I can actually hear that going. Aha! So this big thing here is a sticker. You can see that's released the motor and with it the motherboard. W what? <laughs> okay, um, so most of the transport controls weren't too much of a surprise. What I will say is the colour wheel, which I'm assuming is a rotary encoded to help it with a light gate. That I didn't see coming. I would bet that component there is a little light gate or an infrared tr transmitter receiver. And it just faces this little reflective mirrored disc. And that's probably so it gets positive feedback of the read speed. I mean, I guess with the, the fast and slow feedback, you've got to actively control the motor. You can't just press play with a linear regulator, apply voltage and hope for the best. So, wow. Yeah, I didn't see that coming, but I guess I really should have. So you've got the read-write head coming back to the main part here. Not much on the board. I mean, they've, they've got this down to a fine art from the first release in the, what was it, early 80s of a Walkman to this in 2002, right? They had 22 years odd of uh, improvement. But we've only got one, two, wow, three actual components. The rest are all passives and beautifully laid out board, which is ever so slightly transparent. So I can hold this up to the light see everything on that board. That is a work of art. Okay, so my benchmark for high quality has uh, been pretty much set in 2002 for a tape drive. But what does 2003 and a mini disc player offer? Right, well, I kind of assume that most people are at least familiar with mini discs but uh, I guess not everybody is. So let's have a look at this wonderful, well-loved example with USB, but also with the horrible battery corrosion. This is a mini disc and the age of it's probably apparent by the album that's on here. Uh, this is, I'm sorry getting this wrong. It's either an opto magneto or magneto opto disc. Uh, this was an 80 minute disc and you can see it's sort of they're in these permanently fixed caddies. And I'll see if I can uh, encourage this open without breaking it. I don't remember which port you need to jam something in. There we go. There you can see the actual platter that the data is written on. Um, I really kind of... Ha this is the stupid thing. Having never owned a mini disc, I always loved the format. Um, this is uh, Opto Magneto or Magneto Opto, whichever way it's supposed to be. Um, basically, these are optically read using the Faraday effect, which uh, measures the polarization of light. So basically, once you've recorded to this, you shine a laser on it, and whichever way the light spins off tells you the magnetic field. But to write to one of these, and most mini discs were actually recordable because nobody could afford a mini disc recording deck in their mini system. See, this one's actually got a line in or an optical in. To record to this, you actually use that laser to heat the disc past its Curie point where you then wrote to it like a hard drive. So these are 
really advanced little tiny bits of engineering. And in 1992, the equivalent of a gigabyte could be written to one of these disks. Now that's 25% more than a CD, or 33% more than a CD actually. Um, and it was a re -re rewritable media format. And I have no idea to this day why data mini disks didn't take off more. Well, actually that's not quite true. I do know why, because Sony only ever included the drives in their own computers, which represented a very small chunk of the market share, so they never caught on. This lovely one actually works. Uh, if I put in an album, oh, look at the color array that they came in as well. What's not to like about a mini disc? And you could buy pre-recorded albums on these as well. And obviously I can't play you any music for copyright protection. Oh, it's on hold. Uh, I don't know where the hold button is. There it is, it's on the back. You know, just to make sure you didn't bump it while it was in your pocket. And you could have track information on these. So you could have this scrolling through the disc title, the album and the artist. But of course, if you recorded them yourself, putting that information in using these buttons was very fiddly. So nobody ever bothered. There you go. Mini disc in a nutshell. So. Let's see what a year of extra technology did for Sony. Now for this teardown, I'm just gonna be doing the two, two devices, the tape drive and this mini disc drive. If you really, really want to see me do the other two, these two, and maybe see how bad the corrosion is in this one, head over to the Element 14 community and let me know. I'm A531016. We'll put a link in the description if you really wanna see it, shout. Ooh, that was easy. Ooh, okay, a lot more silicon in this one. I guess that that seems really obvious that there should be more more processing power on here. Um, but yeah, I hadn't expected it. Uh, the tape deck being an analog format doesn't need any uh, signal processing or uh, analog to digital conversion or anything like that. Whereas this is all digital, of course it needs a load of ICs processors. Ooh. <laughs> well, having said this is an optomagneto format, uh, you've got this very odd combination of a magnetic read-write head up here, which looks just like it does in a floppy drive or even a hard drive. This is probably closer to a hard drive than anything else. But underneath, you can still see down there the laser from the optical side. So yeah, this thing's really wearing its heart on its sleeve. That's going to be on a transport arm because, of course, both of those need to pinch either side and move together. Two very large conductors soldered straight onto the PCB, wrapped around. Behind here, they reduce from very large to very small, then go up to the head. Very odd change in conductor size. I guess that's to make it more flexible as it goes around the corner because it gets larger again after. So larger conductor, lower volt drop. Smaller conductor, more flexible, so compromise with both. <laughs> so yeah, even the uh, line input has got gold contact and an optical receiver at the back. So you could do uh, optical in uh, and high speed uh, record from CDs that had optical outputs. Um, or you could use an analog input and record from something else, but yeah plated terminals. This is a wonderfully built machine. Very, very nice. I feel like it was continuing right on from the, the same ethos as the Walkman that were very high quality. So this is the optical sled. Um, got movement driven from here and that moves the diode up and down. Oh no, that moves both up and down. So we've just been moving the magnetic head on this side as well. Awesome. So there's another motor here, which is obviously the spindle motor, which spins the disc. Interestingly, mini discs are constant linear velocity. So the disc will actually rotate slower at the center. No, vice versa. Wait, no. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Mini discs are actually constant linear velocity, which means that the, regardless of whether they're reading from a track in the center or a track on the outside, they cover the same distance and data on each revolution. So at the outside, they need to spin slower to achieve that same linear velocity. You, know, you get a better density, uh, disc density using that method rather than constant angular velocity. Well, there you have it. The, uh, the optomagneto and processing power required to read a mini disc. I mean, this is cool in its own right. I mean, this is 
got some lovely onboard hardware, quite clearly some uh, custom CPUs for the, the purpose, I would think. And the high quality of the components I've used is just astounding. Okay, you've got two very different approaches to what is essentially the same problem of making music portable, taking it on the go with you. You've got the mechanical and analog throwback to the 1960s, which is just stunning as an achievement, but then you've got all the computing and the digital processing, and it's just as little mechanical interface as you can get to that digital solution. And I guess the natural conclusion to this was of course MP3, especially when you had solid state storage, you don't need any moving parts at all. What I will say is I'm a little bit disappointed that Minidisc didn't survive because the big brother to this, the NetMD format, was the HiMD format. And that enabled you to get 45 hours of music on one of these. You could do that in MP3 or Windows Media Audio format. If that was an option and that became popularly available, I definitely would have liked those instead of an MP3 player. Either way, I hope you've enjoyed these teardowns. I've absolutely loved these. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.